Well, how are we doing? You doing all right? Yeah, we're great. We got goofiness happening in the front row, so go the aller behind him. Not quite sure what's happening. Uh, well, welcome again. So uh, this is our last uh, series in our letters to leaders. Uh, but first of all, thank you uh, for acknowledging the fact that I'm here. I suppose. Uh, I'm not someone who takes appreciation well. It's just kind of, it's just it's different for me. So thank you very much to, to everybody, and thank you for just hanging out with us and uh, continuing to show up on Sunday mornings. Um, I truly believe that God has something incredible in store for this church and this community, um, and I think it's going to start and continue, not necessarily start, but continue today with what we're going to hear. Um, and the good thing is it's not really, you're not going to hear from me, so that's what's even better about it. Because um, this guy that's going to talk has some incredible information uh, and just encouragement to share with us this morning. So that being said, so we are on our last week of Letters to Leaders, and I don't know about you, but I have really enjoyed this series. I've enjoyed hearing from other leaders, not only within our own community, but within the church community uh, across the world. Um, it's just been incredible to hear the other voices in the mix of what it means to be a leader, whether we think we are one or not. Because um, as we heard last week, we are leaders at the home, in the home, we are leaders in school, we are leaders at our job, we are leaders uh, here within this church and other capacities. So none of us can say, I'm not a leader, that's for somebody else. So whether you are uh, from Claire's age at age eight, or whether you're 98, but whatever your age is, we all are a leader in some capacity. And so we have learned throughout this series about servant leadership, we've learned about perseverance in leadership, leaving a legacy uh, in our life and in our leadership for others. We have learned about what it means to lead boldly and to live a bold life and to pray really bold prayers. Have anybody prayed bold prayers recently? Nobody willing to? Oh, one. You got one person's one to admit it. Excellent. Good job. Keep praying those bold prayers. Uh, just like John said, pray for our church. Pray for bold prayers for our church. We learned how to lead in a world of distraction and how to turn it off long enough to hear what is in the, the midst of the quiet. Last week we learned about uh, various qualities of a leader and how, how leadership begins in the home. And then this week we're talking about leading for others. In fact, if you look on the stage, there are things that will remind us of that. So for, the word for, the three-letter word for, is a preposition. It is used as a function word to indicate uh, quite a few things. It's used to indicate purpose. It's used to indicate an intended goal. It's used to indicate the object or recipient of a perception. It's used to indicate a desire or activity and many more things. Being for something is natural to all of us. All of us are for something at some point in our life. I am for my family. I do things for them. I want to see the best things happen for the people in my family. I am for this community. I want to see things happen within this community that, that are new, that are improving, that, that make life better here in this community. I am for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Even though they are a hot mess right now. Although they're not as bad as Cincinnati. Sorry. I am for Penn State. I didn't get as much of a groan with that one. I, amen. I am for coffee. I really like coffee, so I want to see, you know, coffee in my life. I am for Jesus. I am for a lot of things, and we all are. And oftentimes, in the world of the church and in the world of Christianity, Unfortunately, the world knows us more for what we are against than what we're for. You see, we know that people say the church is greedy. I mean, good grief, we talked about it today. We want money. We need money, right? So people have this perception that the church is greedy and all they ever ask for is, y'all just want money every time I walk in the door. People think that the church is filled with hate-filled hypocrites. The world thinks that the church is against alternative lifestyles, isn't welcoming to people not like them, is strict, and the list can go on and on and on. You see, the world has this perception of what the church is. But what would happen if you and I and this place right here at 100 North Broad 
flipped the paradigm and let the world know what we were for more than what we were against. What if we flipped the paradigm? What if this what if people in this community and the people in your life and that you influence and that who is in your circle, what if they knew that this church and you, what if they knew you more for what you were for rather than what we're against? I believe if we flip that paradigm that things could change. I believe things could change. So I had the honor of interviewing Jeff Henderson. And again, as I've uh, said previously, if you think of a celebrity within your own kind of world of whatever it is you do, in the church world, this is Jeff. Jeff is a celebrity for all intents and purposes. And, and he was, again, I had a, a little bit of a fangirl moment when I met him. Um, you actually hear the first question I ask him in the video. My voice is kind of nervously cracking. <laughs> As I held my composure not to, you know, look like a goofball. But Jeff came up with this whole four idea. And he shares in this interview on what it means to be a church, on what it means to be a people in a community that really is for each other. And so when I was in Atlanta a couple weeks ago, I sat down with Jeff. I emailed him and I said, hey, I'm going to be here. Would you be willing at all? I said, I know this is a long shot, but would you be willing at all to do an interview with me? And the thing that impressed me the most... Out of all the people that I, I emailed, and I emailed some pretty crazy people, he was one of the first people to respond personally. He said, absolutely, let's make it happen. And I'm like, man, I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm just little old Megan Howard from Fairborn, Ohio. Like, you know, but it just shows the character of who he is and how he lives his life being for other people, that he would take the time not only to personally respond, but that he would take time out of his day to sit and do this interview so that we all could hear his message. So, he has this book out that I'm going to give uh, to one of every family group. Um, if you want another one, I'll be more than happy to give you one. Um, but he wrote this book that is kind of before us. And um, again, if I could have brought Jeff here, I would have. But this is the next best thing. So this is about a 19-minute uh, interview. So again, please humor me and uh, realize that this isn't what happens every Sunday. Um, but I didn't want to miss this opportunity for you to hear what Jeff has to say. Um, so can you, I know you just kind of gave us your background, but can you give us a little bit of your background and how you got to Gwinnett um, and really I know you were in Chick-fil-A, so can you kind of give us kind of a walkthrough of how you went from there to now one of the lead pastors of the church? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'm a preacher's kid, and um, as I was telling you and Tara, I, I promised myself I would never do this. I would never want to work at a church. And, but, so I developed an interest in marketing, and sports marketing in particular. So I worked for the Atlanta Braves, eventually Chick-fil-A, and handled all their sports marketing for them, and it was great. But I was invited to a church leadership conference years ago, and that I really got an incredible vision of what the church could be and what it could do for local communities. And that was really, really when the, I kind of think the seed was first planted. Like, hey, you should, you're going to start a church someday. So I got very involved in North Point Community Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and they were beginning the process of launching their first multi-site location. So long story short. They said, hey, because of your franchise experience with Chick-fil-A and the fact that you've been volunteering here for a number of years, could you come help us you know, get this off the ground? So I did that and so became lead pastor there and was there for eight years and it was just an incredible experience. And then uh, our senior pastor, Andy Stanley, came and said, hey, we we're going to start another church in Gwinnett County, which is northeast Atlanta, and that's where my wife and I are from. And he said, would you be willing to leave Buckhead and start all over? So <laughs> we decided to do that. And that was, I think, Megan, that was eight years ago, eight and a half years ago. And, um, and so that's where we are today. And we've opened up a second Gwinnett Church location about 15 miles from here. So um, one of the things I've discovered, whether it's business or church, guess what's there? People. And yeah. people typically have the same issues. <laughs> Just the same thing. You know? It's a different context and all of that. But I, I've, this has been an, an, an incredible journey. So that's, that's a little bit of our, our journey. So I'm kind of a business guy disguised as a pastor. <laughs> okay. well, so and I, I think this is 
pretty cool. You know, you started this four movement, um, and it wasn't for Buckhead, right? right? right. So, I mean, it, there was something that happened between Buckhead Church and then starting Gwinnett. So what was the catalyst for you and your team to say, we want to we make this for Gwinnett? Can you kind of walk us through that a little yes. bit? Yes. Even in the Buckhead days, there was a little bit of a inkling of that. We, we had a little line that said, it's not about Buckhead Church, it's about Buckhead. Uh-huh. It's not about the church, it's okay. about Buckhead. So, so I could, you know, it was kind of bubbling to the right. surface. But when I left Buckhead, a lot of folks, and I totally understand this, Megan, they said, oh, you've done this before, this will be easy. And I said, I don't, I don't want to hit repeat on this. Mm-hmm. I, want, I want God to do something different. Mm-hmm. I mean, surely we can learn from some things that we did, but I don't want to rely on my own gifting or my own intuition or whatever. Uh, we can, you know, we should be good stewards of our gifts. We all have gifts. You have gifts. Megan and Tara and I have gifts. But I didn't want to hit repeat. So I just said, let's start all over. And we asked two questions. What do we want to be known for? And... We weren't known for anything because we didn't exist at the time. But we said, you know, generally speaking, when it comes to the church, not specifically, but generally, many people are more familiar with what the church is against rather than what the church is for. And that was a big moment in this meeting that we had. And we said, well, let's be known for what we're for. And we said, well, what are we for? And so we said, well, we're for the kids in this community, the students, the businesses. We want to add so much value that if we decided someday to close down, the, the community would, you know, protest and say, you can't close down, because if you close down, our community suffers. So that's where Fort Gwinnett uh, really began to be born, that we wanted to add so much value that people who had said no to church, they would realize the church has still said yes to them. And I think that's a powerful, powerful thing, because many people have said no to church because they've assumed the church has said no to them. And I think that's not the story of the gospel. It, for God so loved the world, the world means you, me, everybody. And so that's who, that's who God loves. And we just wanted to share that with as many people uh, that would be willing to, to hear that message. And so what's been fun, I, I think about, I don't know, it was maybe 18 months, maybe, I got a coffee mug in the mail, and it said, for Winnipeg, huh. uh, with a note that said, hey, we're, we're sharing the same message, and it's really having an impact. And I thought, oh my goodness. And then I started getting t-shirts. And then I, I was at the Orange Conference, and a group from your church, yeah. for Fairburn Church, came up. I had a Chick-fil-A, ironically enough. Uh-huh. And and that's, so those are, that, that's been just so exciting for me because we're also we're learning from y'all we're learning from other churches we're learning together it's really this organic movement because i didn't have like a goal for this i just thought we're just gonna be poor on that but to see what y'all are doing and and other churches are doing it's it's really really cool because we're all we all have the same message and we're just trying to communicate it to our communities and i think that you know, that really leads well into the next question you know it's fascinating to me that it has taken off like it has you know, obviously, it wasn't something you planned. It wasn't like you're going to create this huge movement. Um, and I don't know if you're accredited to this, but when I was watching the playoffs last year, the Atlanta Braves even had the for each other. Right. And I thought, right. you know, that message of being for something other than, you know, yourself or, you know, the four walls of the building has really taken off. Do you, do you think there's, it's not like it's magic dust, you know, that you just sprinkle, but I mean, there's got to be something underneath that. Do you know why it has taken off the way it has? I think it's in many ways a contrast to the climate in our world today. And one of the things we talk about is that in the hypercritical, cynical world, let's be a group of people known for what we're for. And I think it's a very divisive world out there. I think there's a lot of conflict and animosity. And sure, there are some things we need to be against. I totally get that. But I think the the opposite of that message is really a message that people want to believe in and lean into. And it's, it's un- ironically, it's and a little sad. It's a little, people are shocked when you're actually do, do something for them, right? with no strings attached. Yeah. You know, yeah. I tell business leaders today, doing good is good for business. And I just, I really do believe that. And you have to have sound business principles and accounting principles and all that. But I do think doing good is really good for business. And, and so I think people are wanting a more positive message out there. And there are many positive messages out there, but I didn't see, I don't, I don't quite how I feel about this. I've, I've even seen politicians using this a little bit, so which is great. But I just feel like, to your question, I think there's so much conflict, so much animosity, that I think it's a wonderful opportunity for the church to bring um, a great positive message. And I would say this: this isn't some like sweet little message. This is born into 
or, 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 or comes out of John 3.16 and John 3.17, which begins with the word for, for God. And those two verses share what God is in favor of and who God is for. And I, I just believe as churches, one of the most important and sometimes the most difficult thing we need to do is just to stay on message. Let's just say it. I believe leaders are repeaters. You, you need to say it over and over and over again. That's why it's important for you to wear the four Fearburg shirts. It's why you, it's important for us to stay on this message because sometimes as leaders, we can get bored with the message because we're around it all the time. Right. For example, when, when, when I was at Chick-fil-A, a lot of the Chick-fil-A operators said, hey, when are we going to stop stop doing the cow campaign, the eat more chicken campaign? Because they assumed, and I understand this, that everyone had already heard this message. So we did some research in the Atlanta area, Chick-fil-A's home market, and found that it was only just beginning to barely register 10 years, 10 years after it had started. And that campaign is in the Advertising Hall of Fame. So if a campaign that's in the Advertising Hall of Fame is just beginning to barely register, then that's a reminder to me as a leader, i got to stay on message because leaders are repeaters. we just got to say it over and over again. Yeah. You know, I think it's that's a huge point, you know, because we do, we do feel like it's, and I've said it too much, nobody wants to hear this again. Right. And I think what we fail to take into account is there are people that come into the church that are new every Sunday. Yeah. You know, and they may be not have heard it, and so that's a good, a really good thing to remember, so thank you for that. So you have a book coming out. And, uh, fortunate to be one of the conference. I think I have one at my house, too. Um, so why did you write this book? It's funny. So for a mutual friend of mine, I think you know Carrie Newhoff. Carrie's a pastor in, in Canada, and he was in South Dakota. And I think it was a community called Pine Bluff. And they had a sign at their church that said, For the Pine Bluff. <laughs> he took a picture and he texted me. He said, Okay, I've had it. You've got to write a book on this. Uh, and he said, It's really a stewardship opportunity because there are a lot of churches doing this out here. and But they don't have a, a plan or a mindset or understanding of what this actually is. And they're trying to pick it up on Instagram and trying to pick it up on Twitter. But if you could write a book on this, then we could send this to the churches and they could say, here's, and not only for those that do understand it, like you, but for maybe help you and others be able to say, hey, here's what four is all about. So Carrie kind of threw down the gauntlet to Megan and said, you know, do it. And so uh, I'm a little bit of a competitor, so when he challenged me on that, uh, he said, I want you to write a book proposal in 30 days. So anyway, that, that was about two years ago. But when I began to see, because the, the, the last thing I wanted to do is, you know, I don't think this message is mine. I think it was just given to me. I need to be a good steward. But when, when Carrie said, if you don't do this, you're being a bad steward of the message and the idea God gave you, mm -hmm. that's when I kind of sat up and go, oh, and went, ouch. oh yeah, yeah. So I, I, this is mm -hmm. this is uh, an opportunity for me to go, oh, I need to be a better steward of this. So that's why, that's why I wrote it. Yeah, what, I, what I love about the fact that you know, have a book is I can now give this to somebody and say, absolutely, this this is what we're talking about. Right, um, right. And this is not just applicable for churches, which is what I love about this whole four movement is I can take this into my to our school systems. You know, they even started using the hashtag for Fairborn. Yeah. Because they see it, That's they awesome. understand. You know, yeah. I can take this into my office of the government building and say, we need to be a place where we are for this community so that they know that we're doing things to help them and to benefit them and to really you know thrive this community. And so I, that's what when I saw that you were writing, I'm like great because this well, is now you know something that can just be passed on to other people and say yeah so well, that's a that's a great book that's a great point because this isn't a christian book necessarily it's it's a book written by a christian but i wanted you to be able to go into a school system yeah. and be able to hand this out and and for the school system to go oh of course we this this could help our school and so that's what i told our church don't be disappointed if you don't see there's a lot lot of bible verses in here but just know that all of this comes from a biblical principle and a biblical verse. But we wanted it to be, uh, we wanted to have no barriers to businesses and, and the church, uh, to schools, so that church leaders like yourself could go in and just give it away because this would help. This will help, I believe, for Fairburn. I, I agree. Yep. Um, so that's that was really one of the goals too. Well, and I loved. I think you said it yesterday, and I think you said it maybe two years ago when I heard you speak at this conference that. You know, when our businesses succeed in our town, the church succeeds. Absolutely. And, and I think when we are for our businesses, you know, whether they ever come into our doors, mm -hmm. because they are succeeding, you know, and we are for them, we are succeeding. Um, and I think that is huge and, and something that we all need to kind of grasp a hold of. Um, so, again, we're doing this Letters to Leaders series, and if there was one thing that you could 
write in a letter to a leader about this concept, what would that be? I think to answer the two questions, what do you want to be known for and what are you known for? And that's not just true, that's not just two good questions for a church or for a business or for a school or organization. It's really two questions that I think can be thought provoking for you and for me. And I would be careful to kind of dismiss these questions as try to write them real quickly, but to really lean in to think about them. And so here's, here's the challenging thing for me, Megan. If, if I were to tell you, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples if that's okay, but here's what I want to be known for. And then you saw my wife walking down the hall, and you went up to her and said, hey, this is what Jeff just told me he wanted to be known for. You get to answer the second question, that is, what is he known for? And is he actually living up to what his ideal is in, in the first question? Now, there's no perfect person. There's only one perfect person. Right. Um, there's going to be a gap. There's gaps in organizations between those two questions. What do you want to be known for and what are you known for? But our goal every day, through God's help, is to shrink the gap between those two questions. And so for me, a couple, there's several ways I answer these two questions for my own life, but uh, just to give you a real two quick ones. Um, the first one is, I want to be known for being for the person right in front of me. So right now, that's you. And so when you emailed me and said, hey, can we spend a little time together? First of all, I was honored you would even want me to do this. So first things. Secondly, I'm like, absolutely. So today, I want to, in this moment, I just want to serve you and then I get to serve Tara and the church. That's awesome. So, but that, but then when, when we're gone and I go to you know, a coffee shop, the barista right in front of me, that person, I want her or him to know that I'm for them. And I think sometimes in those, we have to be careful as, as Christians, those, that's, that's why I come from the restaurant industry. As Christians, we really need to tip really well. Mm -hmm. Christians don't really have a great reputation in the restaurant industry. Well, I know. <laughs> and that's good from a financial freedom standpoint, sure. but let's be generous as well. So anyway, there, there's, I want to be for the person right in front of me. Then Jesus said, when I return the earth, will I find faith? Okay. So for me, one of the ways I want to be known, what I want to be known for is that if Jesus came back, I want him to find that I'm faithful. I want to be found faithful in all the areas of my life. I want to be found faithful as a husband, a dad, a financial steward, a leader, a servant, a son, all of that. A lot of different roles, but every day is an opportunity for me to be found faithful. So if Jesus were to go to the people in my life and say, Jeff, Jeff wants to be found faithful in these roles, is he, is he living up to that? My goal is to try to live that out. None of us are perfect. I fall down, but through the help and grace of Jesus, I get back up and move forward. So those are a couple of ways for me that kind of have an anchor for me in a, in a, in a directional path to say, hey, I want to be for the person right in front of me, and I want to be found faithful in the areas of my life. And so knowing that, every day is an opportunity to let the world, my world, know who I'm for. Yeah, I like that a lot. So this is our last question. So we're not the size of Gwinnett. We're very smaller in comparison. We don't have all the resources that you guys have. But what is something that, that we as a, as a church in our community of 33,000 people um, can do to be for our community? Maybe it's just you know, one suggestion. And then, I don't know that I need to ask because I love the idea of being for the other person. You kind of answered that for, you know, as an individual. So what is kind of one thing there? Like, if you want to be for your community, do this this week. That's great. First of all, I would say the size of your church is actually a blessing uh, because uh, the size of this church, sometimes we just have, we, move, we don't have the, the, the nimbleness. So it's just, it's very, it's a very complicated sometimes organization. And so to shift and move in a different direction because the world is changing so rapidly. So sometimes the size of the organization can get in the way of trying to make changes. And so, so there's blessings and, blessings and advantages to, 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 to anything. Um, I would say with the size of your church, one of the things you have to fight against is doing too many programming, too much programming. Because good is the enemy of great. And in any church, ours included, in any organization, sometimes what's undermining the mission are all the good things that we're doing. And I think you've got to get laser focused on what what is that? What, what is that, you know, one or two things that you want to be known for? And you can't be known for everything, but you do, do need to be known for something. I would say, just seeing what y'all are doing, I would try to go all in in terms of being for favor. And what does that what does that look like? Well, in the early days of Ford Gwinnett, our leadership team said, hey, we're all on board with this, but what does this actually mean? And I said, well, here's the fun thing. We get to make this up as we go along. 
you know. So for us, part of our context is of the ten largest high schools in the state of Georgia, eight are in our county. So understanding the context of that, one of the things that Fort Gwinnett means for us is we've got to be Fort Gwinnett high schools. So I would say, what does the context of Fairburn look like for y'all? What, what is that one thing in your, you can't do everything, but what is that one or two things in the community that you can do that you can, so that a community leader, when they ask about your church, they would say, oh, you know what they do? They do, and whatever that is, that's what y'all need to do. And, and then the other thing I would do is there's just got to be <clears throat> unity. There has to be unity of, of purpose and, and, and love for one another. And um, I, I, I shared this with the conference yesterday that let's take it from a business standpoint that the customer is eventually treated like the team is treated. So um, let's just say that everybody watching this is on the same team. How the team is treating each other right now at Fairburn um, is going to flow to your community. So I would make sure that there's there's no such thing as perfect relationships. Right. And I tell our team here, if there's no conflict, that means we're not trying hard enough. So it's not the absence of conflict. It's how do we deal and manage the conflict. That makes all the difference. Yeah. And if the relationships at Gwinnett Church on the staff here, if it's highly dysfunctional, highly volatile, that's going to flow to the community. So I would say let's let's make sure that our relationships, you know, it's all a work in progress, but we love each other, we're for one another, for one that means that we're for one another, and then let's go out into the community and let's try to do one or two things that we are known for in the community and try to get that. So I had to cut it off because uh, my camera uh, captures 20 minutes of video at a time. We went over by a minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so kind of how he just ended that whole uh, interview was this is reiteration of what is your church what do you want to be known for and what are you known for and I showed uh, John my husband this last night and the first thing that came to his mind when Jeff said this question what are you known for he immediately said snack pack and then the second one he said was the clothing store so and I think it's really cool because we are already doing this but my, my question for us and my challenge for us is, how can, we, how can we do it deeper? How can we do it more? And, and you know, again, we are, we are already doing it, but I think we can also extend that question of, you know, who, who are, what do we want to be known for, and who are we known for? And what are we known for? So I think those are two questions that, uh, as a church, we can continue to ask. And then, you know, taking it a step further, as an individual, what does it mean for us to ask those two questions? Well, when you, when you think of yourself, you know, what do you want to be known for as a person and, and as a leader? And then what are you known for? And do those two things match up? And, you know, I think, you know, for me, there, there are certain things that I want to be known for and that what I am known for, they might not always match up. And so I need to do a little bit of uh, checking myself so I don't wreck myself, right? So again, I think that's a question that is so uh, imperative for us to ask, those two questions. What do you want to be known for, and what are you known for? And when we begin to align those two questions, not only as an organization and as leaders, but as people, we will begin to live into who God created us to be. And I love that Jeff, uh, this whole book is surrounded and based on, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And he says it is all about what God is in favor of, what God is for. And God is for you, God is for me, God is for the success and the furtherance of the gospel in each church. And I think when we begin to take the message and this idea of being for others, we remember that God is for us first. So what if we live with this mentality that because God loved us so much that he gave all he had. What if we were for others so much that we as a church and as a people gave them all we had? And so I kind of flipped it this way. For God so loved you that he was for you always. For Fairborn UMC loved this community so much that we were for them always. Imagine what that could do. Imagine what you and I in this church could do in this community if we took this mentality of for this church, 
loved this community so much that we went all in. That we went all in. Do you know there are 33,000 people in Fairborn? Are there 33,000 people here? No, it's probably a good thing. I don't know where to put them all. <laughs> but imagine if, if we just started with 1% of our community. 1%. Imagine what we could do if we focused on 1%. And then maybe next year we focused on 2%. And then 3%. And then 4%. And that doesn't mean they all have to be here. Not at all. That just means that we as a church are wanting to flip the paradigm and say, we are for you, period. Because God is for us. Period. I believe that you and I in this church could make waves within this community to show people that they are loved regardless. Isn't that the message of the gospel? Love one another as we have been loved, right? And I love Jeff's suggestion of how we can be for others and for Fairborn. And, and to his credit, there is a fair burn, Georgia, <laughs> and a fair born, Ohio. So was, he kept saying fair burn. And I'm like, I just credit that to your accent. You know, it's a southern thing. But I love his suggestions of, of some things that we could do. Uh, you know, so go to some high school football games. Go, go to, to any high school function or school function. There's lots of them. In fact, uh, Medina, the lovely individual that plays the piano who is sick today, um, but Medina's son, Austin, he's a drum major. So if you go to a football game and you cheer on the high school team, uh, stay for halftime and cheer on Austin as he leads the band. In fact, he was the crown of the homecoming king this weekend. That's really cool. As someone that came from our church and is doing amazing things, and we can continue to cheer him on. We have a bunch of local stores downtown that have some really amazing things and some really tasty food, if you like food. Anybody like food? Shop downtown. One of the cool things that we're doing at the city is, as we're doing this 31 days in downtown, and I'm, I'm highlighting all these businesses in downtown that, that are here and that have history and stories. Go shop downtown. Go visit downtown. It's amazing. There's some really cool shops and cool people and amazing stories to be heard. Come uh, help us with snack pack. They do. They pack once a month now, and they packed a thousand snack packs last last week. That's a lot of snack packs, and that is just a, a, a sliver of all the the kids in Fairborn. Can you can you imagine? So let's let's say this. I'm going off on a little tangent, so I apologize. I'm kind of on my soapbox at this point, but <laughs> so there are more kids in Fairborn and that within the city school systems that could benefit from our snack pack program. We are able to do 260 kids right now because that's what we can afford with the resources that we have. Can you imagine if we decided to go all in on snack pack and we're for Fairborn in that way? I mean, there's a potential that, that we could give all the kids in Fairborn that need a snack pack snack packs. And that number may go from 1,000 to 2,000 snack packs, or maybe even 3,000. But you know what? At that point, man, we are being for our community. So what if we did that? You can volunteer with a clothing store. We, we clothe hundreds upon hundreds of individuals on a yearly basis. And that is such an incredible ministry. And we have people within this uh, service uh, that go down and volunteer. We have people in the first service. We have people from the community. There's, a, there's a, a couple teachers that bring other teachers with them that don't even go to our church that volunteer in our, our clothing store. Go volunteer. See the people of this community that are in need and know that you're helping them. Another great opportunity to be for Fairborn is coming up Friday. Uh, you can go give out candy. And you don't even have to take the kids home with you. <laughs> Please don't take the kids home with you if they're not yours. <laughs> That's a really bad idea. But you have an opportunity to be for Fairborn that way. You have an opportunity to be for Fairborn today by volunteering with a crop walk. And if you can't walk, donate some money. A quarter of the proceeds from the crop walk go to help people in Fairborn. There's so many ways, so many ways to be for others. Find a way. Find a way. Find a way. So I want you to read the book. I want you to, to get some uh, for Fairborn gear. We've got t-shirts. We've got car magnets. If you want something else, just holler at me and I'll find a way to get it. When you go to lunch today, tip somebody really well. Don't be stingy. Deal with a smile on your face. Whatever you do. 
I pray that we are for others, always. Not because Jeff said it, not because I said it, but we need to be for others as a people, as leaders, as organizations, and as a church. Because God was for us first. Amen? Amen. All right, so as I said, uh, I have a book for kind of every family group. Um, if there are more than t 24 family groups uh, in this service, um, tell me and I will buy you a book. That's, that's how important this book is. And that's how much I think it can change your perspective and uh, your leadership. I also have two other books. Um, it's called Start With Why. This is probably one of my most favorite leadership books ever. Um, this is based on the same premise of kind of figuring out who you are and starting with your purpose first. So I have two of those here uh, as well. And if you've read that one uh, and you realize how awesome it was, take it and give it away to somebody else. Uh, so that's, please, please, please. I don't want to take any of these home. I want you to take one. And if you don't want to read it, I want you to give it to somebody else. And say, this crazy lady at church told me to read this, but eh, it's not really for me right now, but I want you to have it. Maybe not word it that way, but please, please, please take them home. I truly believe that this, this four movement can not only change us as individuals and us as a church, but us as a community. Sound good? All right, I'm going to pray, uh, and then we're going to sing one more song, take up our offering, um, which again goes to support all the ministries we do here in this church and in, in this community. And then you all can have an awesome Sunday. Father, we thank you for being for us first, period. We know that uh, without you being for us, that we'd be lost. Help us to keep that in mind always as we go out into the world so that we can be for others, period, always. Lord, we know that all people matter to you, period. May all people matter to us, whether they come into our church or whether they don't. Help us to love others just because. Lord, I pray that something that was said today has given a new perspective to somebody. And Father, I pray that we can act on those new perspectives and I pray that we can truly live into this mentality and this lifestyle of being for others. Period. Lord, we thank you and it is in our holy and awesome name all of God's people said. Amen. So next week we start a brand new series. It's called The Comparison Trap and uh, we're going to look at what it means to not compare ourselves to each other because uh, that's probably something we all do. Uh, so we're going to look at that for a couple weeks. And, uh, but for today, I want you to go and be amazing leaders. Uh, be amazing leaders this week and next week and the weeks to come. Take the lessons that we've learned from these last six weeks and put them into practice. Live into who God has created you and called you to be. And most importantly, know that God was for you, which means we need to be for others. Amen? Go in peace. Amen.